I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell. This is the Fan Forum. All right, here we are. Fan Forum time for the New York Rangers. First time doing a hockey fan forum. Excited to see how this goes. First up with me, the guy who we talk to about the Rangers every time we talk about hockey on this podcast, and the guy who you hear every week in the intro and the outro of our podcast, Pete Considori. Pete, welcome back. How are you? Mike, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm, we're, we're one step closer to hockey, so I'm doing fantastic. I am excited for hockey, too. Also with us today, we last talked about the circle back in, I want to say, April. The great Steve Colzo is here. Steve, how are you? I'm doing well, Mike. Thanks for having me. And last but not least, somebody who's been dying to talk about the Rangers. We let, we've heard him talk about only his football team before, Tennessee Titans. Now he's here talking Rangers. Joe Joffe is here. Joe, how are you? I'm great, Michael. How are you? All right, here we go. New York Rangers time. We are getting ready for the restart of the season. The exhibition game against the Islanders on the 29th, playing the Hurricanes in the first round. And I will start here with the Rangers. And the regular season's over. They're in the playoffs. Pete, give me the Ranger regular season grade. Yeah, regular season grade, I'd have to give them a B. Uh, only because uh, it could be a lot lower, but it could be a lot higher. I'd give them like, kind of the range uh, grade. They really were on a playoff push there at the end. Obviously, we couldn't see how that would pan out because of, of COVID and everything, and that's why they've been considered for this play-in round. Um they they had a lot of concerns, right? Uh, there was a, there was an issue with Bushnevich and Shesterkin because they had gotten into a car accident and they were both kind of shaken up. Uh, Shesterkin banged up more than Bushnevich, so you saw the production of Bushnevich kind of like wither out, which you can also make the, the argument that he wasn't really producing at the rate that he should be. Um, but with Panarin and Mika Zibanejad kind of leading the charge, they were picking up a lot of the slack of not having, you know, Kreider was injured, not having the production they wanted from Bushnevich and uh, you know, goaltending has been an issue for them as well. They have three goaltenders that could start. So um, kind of cycling through them was kind of an issue too, I think. So I'm going to give them a B. All right, Joe, how do you feel about the Rangers season? Uh, I go a B plus, you know, I, I'm actually going to really disagree on Bushnevich. I mean, he had 46 points at the time of the shutdown. So you can say he was on pace for about a 55 point season. I think that's very good production out of Butch Davis there. I, I think and he's a guy that I think gets a lot of flash from Ranger fans still because he was a high-end prospect and really for a long time was the only prospect we had. I mean, from trading all those picks, you know, there was a time where him and Adam Tambellini were our top two prospects, which is crazy to think about now in retrospect. But I'd give him a solid B+. You no, know, I, I agree with the strong you know, end. Um, then you had emergence of guys like Tony D'Angelo, I think, who had – who really, really started last season uh, showing the player he could be and the guy they traded for, for Stefan and Ronta. Um, obviously, you know, I, I think some disappointment in guys like Taco, um, some disappointment in kid like if Libor Hayek who lost his job to Ryan, Ryan Lindgren. But I, I think all things being considered, um, going into the season, they were kind of a bubble playoff team, many people thought anyway. But seeing the young kids that really stepped up this year and produced well, Adam Fox, um, I, I don't see how he can give anything less than a B plus. I think David Quinn also. I think David Quinn did an excellent job this year. Yeah, I think I'm closer to Joe's size because this team really looked like it was going to go on a run. I know the Chris Kreider injury would have thrown things into flux, and I want to go to the next Steve because Chris Kreider gets this big contract extension right before the deadline. They talk for the whole year. They're going to trade him. They're going to trade him. They're going to restock the system. They get hot right before the deadline. They keep him. They sign him. Steve, were you a fan of the cults of the uh, Kreider extension? I kind of went back and forth on it. Me personally being a big Kreider fan, like I followed him also when he was on uh, on BC as well. I wasn't sure what the numbers were going to look like. And before, like kind of jumping ahead here with the, with the whole pandemic, they may have, at the time, I think I liked the deal. I was like, all right, seven years, he's back, he's great. Um, it may be a little concerning down the road when, his, you know, when he gets a little older, his legs may not work as well as they uh, as they do right now. Um, so at the time I thought the contract was actually, it was, it was fine. I think it was a little too high for my liking. But now that the pandemic hit and the cap is going to stay stagnant for, I think the next three years or so, I think they can be in a little bit of trouble with that uh, down the road with everything that has to happen this, this coming off season. 
P, is your view on the Crider extension changed now? It calls up, that Steve brings up a great point here, that the cap flattening, as a result of the pandemic, new CBA, they smoothed it out so it doesn't take a big stock. Does that impact your view on the Crider extension? It does. Um, I think that the Crider extension worked before COVID, um, but now they have the emergence of, like Joe was saying, Tony D'Angelo, right? I feel like Tony D'Angelo is going to be a big uh, back and forth for the New York Rangers when it comes to money. Um, you know, if Kako turns out to be what he is or what he's supposed to be, you're going to have to pay him. Um, you have big contracts in Truba. You have big contracts in um, uh, Panarin. Um, Mika Zibanejad still has a couple of years. Stall, we're going to have a little bit of relief once this contract ends if we try to re-up him or let him go. I'm not too concerned more about the legs, like Steve said, because even if his legs are not like they used to be, he's still going to be like able to keep up, right? Like, I'm not saying Steve was saying he couldn't keep up, but like, I don't think it's that much of an issue. Um, if he was a slower player and we gave him a longer contract and we're worried about his fatigue, I think then we could say like, oh, you know, he's not going to be able to keep up or whatever. Um, yeah, COVID and this flattening of the cap kind of messed it up for me for the, for the prior extension. So I, I wonder what's going to happen when down the line, if we are going to keep D'Angelo, if we have to pay Fox, if we have to pay Taco, um, with the Truba and Panera contracts alone. Yeah, Joe, I remember when we when this deal was made, deadline, you were not for it at the time, so I can only imagine your feelings not improved much since this situation happened. No, I was definitely on board. And also, they also did not trade yes for Fox at the deadline, who was also a pending UFA, which also kind of hurt in retrospect. Um, because with the maybe if the cap went up a little bit, you can maybe try to wiggle yes for Fox in. Now he's going to walk for nothing. And I think yes for Fox, at least a third round pick, maybe more to package him with something else. Um, the, th- the only redeeming quality to me about the Chris Kreider extension is that he is a physical specimen. He's a guy that's not a partier. Um, yeah, he's sure. a guy that talks about drinking chocolate milk before every game. So I think over the long term, I, I hope that um, he's not a guy that I worry about breaking down as much, but you know, 6.75. Is, is a better number than I thought it would be. But I, I still think, you know, considering another first-round pick, another prospect, you know, well, he was Colorado, with Tyson Jost in the first. Um, we don't know what the offers were there. But if you could have restocked the cupboard there. But I think trading Brady Shea also did weaken the blow for me. Um, there's no way we could have afforded both. And Shea was obviously not a bad on D. So really keeping Crider at 1.75 over Shea to me is a no-brainer. Um, but you know, at the time I wanted quite a, quite a doubt. I'm still not thrilled with it, but he's here. So while he's here, I hope he succeeds. And I, I, I don't see, um, you know, I don't see his body breaking down as I would another guy. So I hope he can stay healthy and keep that physical, uh, that physical ability that he has. Right. With Carter, like he is, he's close to, he was on pace for close to, uh, 30 goals this year. However, he like his high in points was, there's only 53, but it's all also the intangibles as we spoke about his speed and like getting in front of the goalie and his size and everything that that can really contribute to the team. And I'm going to bring back Steve. That's a good point you made about Kreider's career high. You know, Kreider's career high of 53 points is about what Butevich would be. And before, uh, you know, your friend brought up the point of Butevich being a disappointment. So, you know, that's kind of the production Kreider's been giving his whole career. So the, the Rangers are taking a really big bet that. This Crider we're seeing with the Benajad is the Crider we're going to get for a long time, and Jeff Gordon better hope he's right. Yeah, let's go. Let's go to another guy's going to be here for the long term. Artemi Panarin, who we all wanted him last off season. He is more than of that contract. He got snubbed from the from the Hart Trophy balloting. Pete, tell me a little bit about like how how thrilled you are with the Panarin year and what we what you think we're going to get at him going forward. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm totally thrilled. I mean, even if this team didn't make the playoffs, I think I think that just watching Panarin play was enough was enough entertainment for me. Um, you know, I finally got to be able to go to a game before COVID and watch them play firsthand. I think it was like the only ranging game I was able to get to uh, last you know this past season. And he's just, it's so effortless. I mean, the the guy is is a god on the ice. I mean, yeah, I mean we're 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 not talking McDavid, but. But he, he has created so much potential for this Rangers team. And, and he's created not only potential, but a role model. Someone that these young kids can look up to um, as, as even a leader of the team. You know, he might be wearing an A. He might be wearing a C in the future. We don't know. 
Um, but he he's definitely someone that, that the the young kids can can model their game after. He produces. It looks like he's having a ton of fun. He loves being in the New York atmosphere, and and I think it's safe to say that the New York Rangers fan base love having him in New York as well. Joe, any thoughts on Panarin? I know you, I know you love the bread man. Oh, oh God! No, yes, I, I he said it bad. So I think the one thing that I think really screams out Panarin is he want granted eleven over eleven million a year will make anybody want to go anywhere, but he wanted to be a New York Ranger, and I mean, really, um, when is the last time the Rangers had a twenty-seven-year-old player of Panarin's ability on this roster in in any iteration of the team ever? You know, the Rangers always seem to be the team that gets the guy two years too late. Um, and for once, you know, we finally got that guy that we've never had. I mean, when's the last time I would say, I mean, even Yager in the late 2000s, the Rangers oh, had a guy was, you could was the last, you know, it's the lead goal scorer, I thought. Right, like who's the last? Well, no, Gabrick was a great goal scorer, but an all-around player. Panarin played both sides of the ice. When's the last time the Rangers had a guy that you could say is no doubt one of the top 15 players in the NHL? I think it's been a long time. Yeah, um, it's definitely been a while. So, yeah, for, for the Rangers to have that on top of what the Stride Nickers of Benedict have made, on top of, you know, I'm not one. I mean, all these people that are hating on Paso have no clue about what they're talking about. The kid's 18 years old. He's played so much hockey over the past year. Uh, to, to see what the Rangers are building is really exciting. And our Tommy Panarin, so if you go back uh, to the 1994 Cup team, they got Mark Messier, you know, in 1992, I believe, was the first year of the team. It took two years, they won the Cup. You know, I think eventually when the Rangers win the Stanley Cup with this group, which, of course, they're going to do, as we all know, I know the, the July 1st signing of Panarin is going to be that turning point that, you know, this is when we took that step. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, he's made such a tremendous impact on this team. I mean, he sort of elevated a lot of the young talent around him. Steve, I'm going to go to you here. Like, which of these young guys really impressed you the most this year? Uh, for me, I I had written these down my notes a little bit, but it's got to be Adam Fox. Um, they have a lot of them, and you know, to go along with him, Lindgren that, that goes, uh, goes along with them. Uh, but they've they've played great this year. He's exceeded my expectations for sure. He's loved by the fans, or especially the, the announcers, and Quinn seems to love him, and the players seem to love him. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's got to be my guy. Um, I'm also a defensive guy, so I'm going to go with Adam Cox. Pete, anybody else that you that appeals to you other than Fox? So so I would I would say uh, Fox as well, Lindgren, but I also think we need to take a good look at Shester Kent. I, I really liked how he was between the pipes, as, as few or many times as you want to say he, he started. Um, or played, I, I really think there's a lot of potential there. Um, and I think this past season he's shown that if he keeps working, and he, even now he's, he's just, uh, in my mind, a starter. But um, if he keeps working, we may have a, another Lundquist in our midst. Yeah, that brings up a great point, which is that Chester came with, been with my guy, because like the way he came in at the NHL, this dominated was incredible. And it's led to a very interesting conundrum for the Rangers in goal right now. And as of recording time, it looks like the point that Chesterkin is going to be the favorite to be the goalkeeper. Joe, is that where you would go here? Would you, or would you rather rely more on Hank's experience and his num- great numbers against the Hurricanes? Well, I, I think all three of you are going to hate me when I say the following sentence. I know Steve for sure will hate me. I think the Rangers and their best interest is to lose to Carolina. Oh, I believe. God. Yeah, shut up, Steve. I think. <laughs> That's twelve and a half. That twelve and a half percent take. chance. Uh, you, you get your turn next. I'm speaking. That twelve and a half percent chance to get Alexis Lafreniere. And you want to talk about a franchise changer? If the Rangers can have this roster a year older with Lafreniere, the, you, it, you're, you are in a different category of team. So really, if I'm David Quinn, I am playing Henrik Lundqvist. I think you could pitch it to the fan base as we're giving Hank one shot here. Um, and it's a five game series. Like you give Hank the whole series. If he loses, he loses. Georgiev's the one you can't play. I mean, it's either you play Lundqvist or you play for Jorgen. I mean, there's no middle ground for Georgiev. It, it's sad for him because he is a very good young goaltender who I think another guy that may be a casualty of the staff freeze. Um, but for me, 
I am playing one quick knowing I'm probably playing my third best goalie. Um, and and you, not saying you tank, but a 12, the, to me, the Rangers have a better chance at number one pick at winning this Stanley Cup this year. So for me, I'm still looking at the future of this team, and I think that's Alexis Offer here. All right, Steve, I know you have issues with Joe had to say, so go. A lot of issues with Joe and a lot of things, but yes, especially this take. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I would go Shisterkin. I mean, I'm one of the biggest one quick fans out there, um, but I think, you know, I mean, he's going to replace it. It's as simple as that. You know, he's 10 and 2, 2.52 goals against average. I think he's, well, he definitely is the goalie of the future, and he's lived up to the bill right away. I'm a you play to win the game type type guy. I'm not a you know let's let's lose for a twelve percent chance or whatever it is at the at the number one pick next 12 year. Twelve and a half. Twelve and a half. Whatever. Uh, still not you know maybe if you gave me like a ninety percent chance maybe I say you know what maybe it's worth it. Um, but no, at the end of the day, I want the Rangers to win. I want Shesterkin in the net. I think that's the best chance for them to win. Um, and none of this nonsense of like sure it's a nice consolation potentially if they lose, but I'm not rooting for them to lose. Yeah, P, if your stance changes the last time we talked about this. Yeah, I think that you just go six skaters empty net. No, I'm kidding. Um, I, I actually, you know, I, I want to, I'm going to go with Joe here in the fact yeah. that I think the experience in Lundquist will be good to give him one last shot. But I actually want to pose a question to Joe. Sure. We're talking about the future. Sorry, Mike, I know this is, this is your go part for, in the whole show, it. but I have a question. Uh, <laughs> if we're looking for the future, and let's say right. we do get lost in the air, and we have to pay Kako, and we don't get rid of D'Angelo, and we have to pay Fox, and we have to pay Lindgren, and we have Truba, Mika, Kreider's contract, um, Panarin's contract. What happens when we go and have to pay for Lafreniere? Where, and, or, and we have to pay for Shesterkin, let's say. What, what happens there? Does the, long-term then, does the long-term future of the Rangers suffer because we get that first overall pick? It's a fair question um, because the salary cap only lasts so much. But to me, it's a problem you cross when you get there. Well, look at the Toronto Blue, uh, Maple Leafs. That was a blue game. Um, I'm busy watching baseball. It's a great <laughs> thing. Um, but if you look at the Maple Leafs, you know, yeah, they're in a bad cap situation. But at the same time, they have John Tavares, Mitch Marner, William Nylander, and, and that guy Austin Matthews. Like, they're, it, having too much talent to pay is a good problem to have. And um, they'd probably have to get creative. I think that would probably mean trading probably a guy like D'Angelo or Kreider or Truba. I know Truba has a no trade clause that kicks in a certain year. Same thing for Kreider. Um, I think it's no trade for the first few years and it kicks at the end. Um, and, and if all these guys live up to the billing, that's okay. That's a good problem to have. And maybe, no, I'm being optimistic here, Sidney Crosby took less to stay in Pittsburgh and keep the band together. You know, you have guys that have taken less. That was the problem in Toronto. None of those guys were willing to take a little bit less to keep the mm-hmm. team together. If Jeff Gordon has that problem, he can try that tactic, but that's a, you cross that bridge when you get that problem. You can't say, I don't want Law for here now because you have to pay him in four years off of the DLC. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Yes, yes. I think it's definitely an interesting conversation. I, I get the idea, like, you know what, like, Chesterkin's our future. Like he's looked great in the in the camp. Let's give him some playoff experience. But at the same time, I mean, I'm very tempted by those numbers that Hank has against Carolina. And Hank was good against them like twice this a couple of games this year. And like when the matchup is Carolina, and, that's something I'm very intrigued by. And when the when the lights are brightest, one quiz one quiz shines. Now, granted, he's a little bit older, and I don't know, and who knows what a playoff atmosphere without fans would be, and with everything like that. That's but, true. And playing Carolina, you know Brady Shea is good for a bad turnover to a game. Yep. <laughs> On the other end. So that will help. That will help. Yeah, I think this thing, I know Joe wants to lose in the in the restart here, but, like, for me, I think this is a matchup they could win. I, mean, I think they do match up well with this. You know, you get Carolina's healthier now, but, like, they got Kreider yeah, back, yeah, which was, is huge. Well, I think it's – Joe's not saying, like, I think Joe thinks they can win this round. It's after that is the, the top teams yeah. that, right. that he doesn't see the Rangers getting past. Yeah. And, and, and let's let's do an honest assessment here. Are we are I'm not saying the Rangers can't beat any of these teams. But we're not better than Boston. No. We're not better than Washington. No. We're not better than Colorado in the West. The Rangers are a very good team. They're not a complete team yet. So for me, say we get I think the Rangers can beat Carolina. Um so say we beat Carolina, they get bounced against Boston. What does that do? Like 
they, these, these young kids got quote unquote playoff experience in the no atmosphere situation. It's not like they'd be playing in front of a Rocket Boston Garden with 20,000 screaming Bruin fans. They're playing in an empty arena with pipes and crowd noise potentially. So it's not like the, I, I get the playoff experience thing, but it's not the same playoff experience this year. So for me, give me that, give me that lottery ticket at Lafreniere over a, a first or second round exit to Boston or Pittsburgh or uh, any of those other teams. My worst nightmare is the Rangers winning the first round, the Islanders losing the first round, and the Islanders winding up the first overall pick and having to hear that's something pretty, for that's the rest of my life. That's a pretty bad nightmare, I'm going to be honest. But, 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 and also, let's also look at the teams here. The NHL is sitting on a situation where they have the potential to send a lot. I mean, I'm not saying they're going to rig the draft here, but let's, let's not pretend that may not happen. They're yeah. sitting on a chance to send him to Chicago, Montreal, and New York. You're telling me the NHL right now, after losing all this money during a pandemic, would not want Alexis Lafreniere in one of those three markets? Don't kid yourself. If they could find a way to build a New York Rangers super team with Alexis Lafreniere and get him here, the NHL would be over the moon if that scenario played out. Do you, so, do you think? Do you think that's why they allow the play-in round team to get the lottery ticket to get the first round pick? To be you know, I, I think it's a. Again, I don't want to be Mr. Conspiracy Theory here, but how amazing did this work out for the NHL that now a mystery team has the first pick? Oh, my God, how convenient did that work out? I mean... Yeah, Red Wing fans are human. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> and, you, and again, you have Chicago. The NHL will... The NHL just lost how much money through this pandemic. If they have oh, yeah. the opportunity to rebuild either Montreal, New York, or Chicago, one of their major markets, and get this kid on one of those teams, don't think they scoff at that opportunity. Because say uh, Carolina loses and they get the first overall pick, getting Lafreniere in Carolina doesn't make the NHL a lot of money. Getting Lafreniere in New York or Montreal, Chicago, oh, they'll cash in on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Joe, let me ask you this then. Like, let's say, like, obviously we know that the – the number one pick, thanks to that really dumb lottery the NHL ran, is going to a mystery team. Now. And we'll we'll say this right here. Like, of the teams that could lose in the playing round, where's the one place you think the NHL would not want Lafreniere to go? Oh, boy. Um, I mean, Carolina, I mean, Columbus. Now, if, if the Blue Jackets, I mean, the Blue Jackets play the Maple Leafs in the first round, I, Toronto should win that series. I mean, let's, I think we all agree there. Does the NHL really want Alexis Lafreniere in Columbus? And I'm a, I mean, I'll use Carolina again. I mean, is Carolina really any hot fed major uh, hockey market? I, I think the answer is no. So I think any of those any of those cities where I mean, Columbus is the no man's land for hockey. So if they can get Lafreniere in a major market, and I think the Islanders does count as a major market. It's not the Rangers, but if they can get Lafreniere, Paco, and Hughes all in the tri-state area, that's pretty good too for them. Yeah, I think for me, the one I would question like in this thing is like, I could see no way the NHL wants Sam to Winnipeg. Like, what does that game mean? <laughs> or Florida. Yeah, well, I would say the Panthers. Yeah, I would think that the one thing with Winnipeg, though, I will say, is that maybe Jeff Gordon could hoodwink them into training for training for him? That's a possibility. <laughs> Neil, what, Neil Winnipeg Pionk and Lafreniere for Truba. Let's make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Winnipeg. Think about the situation Winnipeg did. Their top defenseman said, "No, nah, I'm not playing this team because I don't want it." Like that, that's the that's the situation they were in. Like, right. how bad do you have to be to get your top defenseman to be like, "I'm not doing this this year. <laughs> I'll talk to you guys next year." Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, Winnipeg. It, I mean. They have great attendance. If you watch some of the playoff games there in a few years ago, the whiteout, the, the atmosphere was great. Now, it doesn't seem like it's a bad – it's not like, again, Florida where they're playing in front of 10 fans. You know, Winnipeg does have a fan base that goes to those games. Yeah, they do. I also look at some of these other teams. I mean, like, I mean, you could prop up a market like Minnesota. That's not really going to do much for the league. I do think, like, if they had their way, it would be, like, one of the original six teams is in this round that could lose. Like, and I could just see them like being Canadians at the same. Level. Like Toronto, get in there, makes maybe they'll win the cup for the first time since '67. Yeah, I mean, but at least Minnesota, while it's not a major NHL market, 
Minnesota is a hockey community. Yes. So yeah. getting him somewhere like the Wild would not would be like an under the radar fly move because Minnesota and hockey is big. You know, you have you know there is a nice built in community there. So Minnesota really is not a terrible place. But I, I think Florida or Columbus or Carolina is just he he'll rot there. I mean, even look at Svechnikov in Carolina. This kid's incredible. Arizona yeah, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The whole theory, Austin Matthews going back home didn't work out so well. No, it <laughs> it did not. But let's talk. We'll talk about the expectations here. You guys, are you guys in consensus here? The expectation is that they can win this first round. Then beyond, that's gonna be tough. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Carolina is no doubt a winnable round for them. Uh, I think. It, uh, can they lose? Can can they play Stuart York and lose this series? Absolutely. But if they have their best team playing their best hockey, they should beat the Carolina Hurricanes. Yeah, Pete, do you think that you could see a scenario somewhere where maybe like Shesterkin stands on his head, they could steal steal another round? I, I mean, we saw with Matt Murray in Pittsburgh, right? I mean, granted, they had Crosby, Malkin, and Kessel in front of them, too. Uh, you know, Latang and all those guys. But, but I mean, look, that's the beauty about hockey playoffs, right? I mean, anything can happen. I mean, look at the, the, the year the Kings won. Uh, against the Rangers in 2014, which still hurts me to this day. I mean, they were they were a wild card team that got in and went all the way. Um, so, I, it, look, it's a possibility. It's a possibility Hank can go in and he goes, I'm not going out the way that everyone thinks I'm going to go out. I'm going to stay on my head. He wins us, you know, two or three rounds. We, I, I can't, I can't say that's not a possibility, but I, I'm going to stay on the side of Carolina is definitely a beatable team. It's the teams after the playing round that really concern me. Yeah, I, and I mean. If you want to talk about a crazy scenario, if the Blackhawks beat Edmonton and Edmonton winds up with the first overall pick and they get Chuck. Bryce Seidel, David, and Lafayette, yeah. I mean, come on. They're going to, they're going to need the money anyway because their they're whole uh, arena flooded. Yeah, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, at, plus the other doomsday scenario would be like if Carey Price stands on his head for three games and he ends up in Pittsburgh. Uh, uh. But at, at least, at least, at least, at least, at least, Crosby and Malkin are on their back nine. As good as they are, yeah. how many years can they still be what they are? That is fair. First, that, then you get, then they get replenished, and it's a whole another dynasty of that. No, but you're losing Malkin and you're losing Crosby. Lafreniere will not be able to replace two. Yeah, they'll replace one. Right. Well, speaking of the playoffs here, like we'll go around on the horn here. I'll start with Steve. Who's your X factor for the Rangers in the playing round? Well, I think it's a little too easy for me to say. Like, like this this team goes as far as Panarin and Benajet go. But for my X factor, I'm going to say Kako. Um, I think he's with Butchnevich. Whatever he's been dealing with, we don't know. Have they announced what what Butchnevich has been out with? But anyway, he's been playing with. Um, Benajet and Kreider, and all reports are that he's been playing like playing great with them, and seems like a completely different player. So, besides Panarin and Benajet, which I think are the easy answers, um, I think Kako is a really important part for this uh, this playoff run. Uh, Joe X Factor. Well, since Steve took my pick of Kako, I'm gonna go Ryan Strom. I, I think you know I, I agree. Uh, if Steve had not answered Kako, I would say Kako. But, you know, Ryan Strom's another guy that is playing for a contract. And um, if Ryan Strom goes out there and continues to be what he is and keeps feeding Panarin the puck, which I'm pretty sure any four of us could do with somewhat okay ease and look good doing it. But if Ryan Strom can keep putting the puck in the back of the net, um, I, that gives the Rangers two legitimate scoring lines, and that's what's going to be really dangerous. Pete, you're X Factor. Yeah, so I, I agree with, with uh, Steve and Joe, but I, I think it's going to come down to goaltending. I think because, it, like Joe said, you're not starting here yet. He's just not in the picture right now. I think you have one guy who's trying to protect his legacy as the King of New York and another guy who just came in this season uh, humbly trying to learn from the King of New York and trying to show the Rangers that he is the, the, the Prince of New York, right, is, is his nickname. So I think it's going to come down to goaltending. It's going to be very difficult, you know, I agree with the whole Panarin, Kako, Strom. With a healthy Dougie Hamilton, that defensive core, except for maybe Brady Shea's turnovers, is going to be a little difficult to get through in Carolina. Um, I think it's going to come down to goaltending for the Rangers, ultimately. I'm going to go off different for you guys. I have somebody else in mind who 
no, made a big deal. We got him. Is not lived up to the hype. I think they got to get more out of Jacob Truba in the playoffs. I mean, he's been. I get these not had a great partner. They've been running Brendan Smith with him, which is not ideal. But they need to get more out of Truba. And let's not forget his opening day tearing with Lebor Hyatt. Yeah. Yeah. I just think. Do we have time to talk about Brendan Smith? Sure. Can we can we just can we just put that out there to Steve and Joe? Like, what are your thoughts about Brendan Smith? I mean, that guy's been moved around the roster so many times. At this point, is he even worth keeping? Steve, you want to put it No, Joe, take it. Sure. Um, I, I definitely, I mean, let's not forget that Brendan Smith is a guy that Quinn has a long-time relationship with. I can see Brendan Smith sticking around as the, the 13th man on the roster a la Michael Hanley this year, eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously, that contract has not worked out as a range of hope. Um, but he, he is a guy that has not been that bad this year. I mean, he, he's not He's not worth the money he's making, but to say he isn't playable is also a lie, too. So I could see at the end of next season when his you know, $4.25 million a year is up, I could definitely see David Quinn saying, you know what, he can play forward, he can play defense, he can go penalty. Let's leave him on the roster at league minimum, 900 k and he's a guy that seems to be liked in the locker room. I, I definitely think Brendan Smith can have a longer future with the Rangers than some fans think. Uh, I think he's a little bit a little bit too hated at this point. Granted, Quinn doesn't make his decisions based off you know the fan base, but like I, I loved him when he first came to the Rangers, and they signed him, then he sucked. Then this year he redeemed himself a bit. So no, I, I, I somewhat agree with Joe. I think he still could have a place. I just don't I don't think he will. Well, the the thing with Smith and and, and it goes back to the Ottawa series. Bre- Brendan Smith and Brady Shea. And that Ottawa series was our best defense pair. And a lot of Vigneault just decided, I want to put Stolen Holden out there every night to blow mm-hmm. for whatever reason. So, you know, Brendan Smith. Yeah, that was, definitely a, that was definitely a coaching factor there. I, I definitely yeah. agree with you so, with that. I would love to know what happened to Brendan Smith from that offseason beyond. Because the guy they saw, I mean, and I talk about this a lot. There's a difference between a bad move and a move that doesn't work out. I think after that Ottawa series, signing Brendan Smith was a good move that just hasn't panned out. And the guy in that Ottawa series is a guy well worth keeping on the roster. I just don't know where he went. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good point Joe makes about the good move, about the bad move versus didn't work out. Like, I'll, give, I'll put it to in Met terms, in my opinion. Like, Jed Lowry, good move, did not work out. Robinson Cano trade, awful move. <laughs> They, they just sort of signed Craig Kimball if they wanted to call him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the logic at the time with the Jed Lowry contract, and Joe, you're aware of this, like, it's not thinking, okay, we don't know if Jeff McNeil's an everyday guy. We don't really know if Todd Frey's going to be held to third base. He can cover both spots. Sure, this is great. Now he's played, like, he's played, got nine at-bats in two years, no hits. He's on the IL. Like, not not much came out of that contract. But at the time, it's a good move. Right. No one could have argued against that Jed Lowry contract the day it was signed, unless you're Nostradamus. Even I'll go back to you, Mr. King Phillips. Pedro Feliciano with the Yankees. Pedro <laughs> Feliciano signed a two-year deal with the Yankees <laughs> and did not play in a single game. Yeah. But it made sense when they signed him. But what happened? I, I couldn't tell you. Well, I could have told you that. I've, as Pedro Feliciano guy, I know the hockey fans. I'm sorry we're turning you off with the baseball talk here. Like yeah. they, The Mets just ran his arms to the ground. And I could have. I warned all the Yankees. I'm like, he's going to not do anything for you guys. But literally not pitch. Yeah, that I, that far did not get. I thought he was going to suck. I didn't think he was not going to actually not pitch. Right. Yeah. That's the challenge, and that's a challenge the Rangers are having in the off season too. Is that to make some big decisions, and obviously the flat cap hurts. Pete, I'm going to go to you. Like, what would your off season plan be right now, knowing that the cap is what it is, and you have Cryer locked in long term? Man, this is just a tough one. I, I've spoken with Joe before on this as well. Is that? Like, I think Jesper Foss is probably gone, sadly. Like, he's the player's player, but I don't think they can afford him because they got to pay Strom, they got to pay D'Angelo. And I do they trade Georgia in the offseason? I think so. And then keep one quick next year to back up. Uh, it's just certain. That's what I think is going to go on. Uh, Pete, do you think they can actually afford to keep both uh, Strom and D'Angelo? Or you think they're going to have to let one go? I think at the time being they can, uh, but I think at, at some point, 
You know what's going to be interesting, too? We can't forget, you know, as long as COVID didn't mess this up, we can't uh, forget about the expansion draft. We're going to lose one player to the expansion draft for Seattle if they do it the same way as they did Vegas, which I'm assuming they are. So that may help contract negotiations because it is so close, right? Um, so personally, to me, this offseason, I would be trading people that we can get value from so we don't lose them to a UFA or, or anything like that. Um, but I think right now you have to stick with what you have because, again, you don't have to pay Kako yet. Um, Panarin and, and Truba have already been paid. You know, uh, Kreider, they're all, you know, Stahl's contract, I think, at the end of next season, yep. you know, done, right? If, yep. I'm, if I'm getting yep. the contract yep. correctly. Next off season is Stahl, Smith, Long Long and then the Seattle Turks buyout drops in six. To two. Right. Right, so so I think I think right now you you, you kind of have to try to pay him or give him a bridge. You know, you know anyone that has a deal that you need to try to resign, maybe give him a bridge deal and say, look, we got to see what's happening with with uh, the expansion before we can give you a number and give him like a year extension or something. So right now you trade what you can get value from, and then hope that you don't lose someone that you have your eye on in the expansion draft, and then use that space to to sign the big boys. You know. Joe, what about you? What's your offseason plan? Sure. Um, well, the Rangers have about $14 million in space here to work with. To me, a, a two-year $10 million deal screams to me this makes sense for Ryan Strom. Uh, Strom's making three point two now, so he gets a nice little raise. I, I, yeah. I think two years at five per is a great number for him. He is an RFA, so it buys out one year, and it gives the Rangers really a two-year plan to find that center for Panarin. I think the Angel has to Day. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of people on the trade D'Angelo bandwagon. That's one I've never understood. The guy was on pace for 50 points this year. The last Ranger defenseman to do that was Brian Malik. It's not like we it, it, 60 point defensemen don't grow on trees. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so I, I think D'Angelo's number is going to be tricky. I, I think the closer to six, the better. I think it's probably going to be more than six and a half to seven. But even if D'Angelo signs for seven and Strong's at five, that still gives you two million. I think Georgiev has to go, unless Lundqvist retires. If Lundqvist says, let's just say, hypothetically speaking, the Rangers play Lundqvist, he, he, they go as far as he can take them, and he says, you know what, do I really want to be a backup goalie again next season, deal with this nonsense? If Lundqvist retires, the Rangers' offseason is wide open. Um, if Lundqvist decides to stick around, I would not buy him out. I, I would, no more buyouts. No, we, we, no, no, we yeah. no more buyouts. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I, I I think your with the flat cap, I agree with you about Jesper Foss, and I think your give is an RFA um, also. And hopefully, you know, keep brought up the, the Seattle draft, just take Brett Howden. Wherever we have to give you to take Brett Howden off the roster, uh, that, I'm fine with losing him. Because the amount of, you know, hopefully Morgan Barron on the team by that point, Garcia, uh, the Rangers, you know, Jeff Gordon deserves a nice credit here. For also building up the Rangers' bottom six. You know, I know a lot talked about the Panarin, the Benedict Taco, but you no know, little fly moves. You know, Brendan Lemieux coming over last year, uh, going to get Garcia for Joey Keane. Uh, if you look at the Rangers teams in 2014, they were great because Dominic Moore, Brian Boyle, those mm-hmm. guys in the bottom six. That even though the Rangers never had that top line, they had four lines that could play with any line and can really outdo other teams' third and fourth lines. So I think Jeff Gordon, yeah, yes for Fox is going to be a big blow, um, but they can replace yes for Fox. I, I, if I'm Jeff Gordon, again, the number one pick changes everything. Um, but I, I'm, you got to keep find a way to keep D'Angelo on the books. you got to find a way to keep Strom. And I think Georgia has to go if, if Henry Hunk was not going to retire. Yeah, the thing with that Seattle expansion draft is interesting because the Rangers have so many young guys, and a lot of them are not going to have to be protected, which I think helps out a lot. And I am looking at an article from this week's podcast guest, Rick Carpaniello, and on the yeah, athletic, talk about the, who the Rangers could lose. And based on the same criteria, assuming the guys could do the same ideas that they had for the last expansion draft, basically his idea is assuming that this he also has Georgiev here in this scenario, basically. Protects the seven forwards, Panarin, Zbanajad, Kreider, Strom, Buznevich, Heedle, and Howden. Defensemen, Truba, D'Angelo, Lindgren need to be protected, and Georgiev. And you're looking at, like, basically your top options for being exposed are Brendan Lemieux, uh, Julian Gaudier, Phil Giuseppe, 
like Libor Hadjack, like those are the big names out there. So like there's n- they are in good position to like uh wa- like uh expansion draft wise. Hey Howden, please. Yeah. If someone has Brett Howe's number, tell them how lovely <laughs> Seattle is. They have good coffee. So they it doesn't rain as much as they say. Yeah, he, he, yes, they have the Mariners. You can go to the Mariner game. The you, you can go. You can go be the twelfth man. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, and this isn't a knock on Brett Howden, but you know, if if we're gonna lose somebody, you know, you know, we lost Oscar Lindbergh to Vegas, who I really like, and I'm stunned what happened to his career after he left New York. But I, I think the Rangers are in pretty good shape, as you said, Mike. Um, I, I don't see you know us losing any big big key players to Las Vegas. Yeah, and I will say, like, I mean, for Seattle, excuse me. Yeah, for Seattle, and I will say, it's definitely a lot of fun to be a Ranger fan because of like. Of all my teams, I'd say like the Mets are close. I feel like they have the clearest like window to a title of all my teams right now. And, and it's nice because if you look at the at the Eastern Conference again, as I said it before, you know how much longer can the Capitals be the Capitals? How much longer can the Penguins be the Penguins? The Bruins are going to be around for a long time. They have a pretty good contract. Um, Pasternak has the best contract in hockey. I'm sure anyone says. Um, but there's a, there's a nice window coming where I, I can see the Rangers and the Avalanche being kind of the two kings of the, the East and the West. All right, I'm going to go quick here on the last thing. Gun to your head, Steve. Do the Rangers win a cup the next five years? Next five years, I think they at least make it to the finals. Okay. So if they win one, sure, why not? But I think they'll make one. I think they'll make a final. Pete, same question. Yeah, no, I think they're winning in, in the next five years. Joe, I'm assuming you're on board with that? Absolutely. I, I think if, if I mean, if the Rangers don't, um, I, I'd be stunned. And like Steve said, at least, at least a trip to the top. I mean, there's got to be, I, I don't, if, again, pending health, you no know, health can obviously change everything. But if this team's healthy and, and sure can continue this, I don't see how they don't make at least one top one. I mean, this team, at their height, should be much better than that 2014 team. On paper, there they should be talented enough to make it there. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel like you could have like a sort of like a young Blackhawks thing forming here with all this talent that you have, especially up, up front in the lo- like at this. I think they do need like another center. They do need to figure out the defense situation, but there's a lot here. And I'm going to shove this in Steve's face real quick. If you look at all these dynasties in our, you know, let's say the past 15 years, Malkin and Crosby, Kane and Kane. Um, Ovechkin and Backstrom. They, there was always that second top pick. And if the Rangers can get Lafreniere, you have Lafreniere and Kako on top of Panarin and Zabinijad, we have three cups in the next five years. I also think it's incredible we did not even mention because Zabinijad that much and what a breakout season he had this year. Absolutely. Yeah, Pete, before we go, any, any thoughts on him? Yeah, I mean, I just, I think he's been working up towards this. I mean, I, I don't think this is any, I don't want to say it's not a shock, but I don't think, it, yeah, I'll say it. I don't think it's a shock. I think he's been working up towards this since we got him for the trade for Broussard. Um, I mean, he's, he's definitely grown as a hockey player, um, maturity level on the ice game wise, um, definitely a leader in the locker room as he wears the ice. So I, I, I really don't think it's a shocker to, to the New York Ranger fans that, that, that he's, he's getting to this level of play. And I think he has more room to grow. I honestly think that, you know, he could do better. I mean, I remember a few years ago, we were complaining about how he couldn't hit the net for most of his, you know, shots. And now he's settled down more. He's playing in a bigger, bigger market than he was in Ottawa. Um, and he settled down he's, and he's producing. And I think he's just going to keep going up. I don't think he's hit a ceiling yet. So uh, not a shock for me. Yeah, Joe mentioned a uh, passion act contract, but Mika's advantage with the Rangers is pretty team friendly as well. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. I think Pat's not going a few more years as a veteran, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean, looking. I mean, one thing, the biggest thing that the Ranger ha- the Rangers have here in their, in their favor is that Jeff Gordon's been a wizard at GM between all the gymnastics pulled with the Winnipeg over the Jacob Truba thing and basically flipping like Kevin Hayes and a pick to Winnipeg and then getting the pick back. I mean, that was pretty nuts and. I think that one and the heist for me still the Zabana dad trade where he basically got him and a second round pick for Tarek Broussard. And you know what we did with that second round pick? Yeah. Eric Stahl, baby. 
Yeah. You want to talk about a lot for you, uh, Elaine Mignot's biggest gap? And that one, boy. Yeah, that was the biggest he win. Can. That was a big that that one that decision, and then obviously Strawman for Dan Boyle also a bad call. Well, um, I'm still going to say, and uh, I, I think Steve knows what's coming here. Um, I don't think Alain Mignot misused any player more than Keith Yandel. I mean, Yandel is still putting up points in Florida, and for whatever reason, Alain Mignot did not put him on a power play. I, I've still never figured it out. I've tried hard for years. I can't do it. <laughs> um, I mean, it, that, that brings me back to the whole Tortorella, Tortorella that, uh, excuse me, I can't talk, Tortorella Crider situation. I mean, Tortorella yeah. sent Crider up and down about 85 times. Yeah, and no one could understand me. why. Yeah. But, he hated well, him. Like, it, I think in retrospect, Tortorella looks pretty good here because Crider still has never, up until this season, he still has never been that guy that I, I think a lot of fans thought he would be. Yeah, I think with that, I think we'll leave it here. We'll close the Ranger fan forum. If they get, if they go on the deep run, we'll all come back. We'll talk about it. But for now, we'll we'll call it here. We're on the horn. Get ready some social yeah, media. No one, no one's gonna be uh, more sad if the Rangers win the first round more than Joe. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, if we win the first round, we better win the whole thing. That's all, <laughs> all right. If we win the first round and win the whole thing, I will start the COVID Cup parade myself. <laughs> if we win the first round and go out in a whimper in round two or three, not getting that Lafreniere shot to me to mistake. Well, we'll see what happens. They'll go around the horn real quick. Everybody, some social media plugs. Uh, Pete, you want to go first? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at pjconsidori29 or Instagram peterj392. And Pete, we'll be talking next week. We'll talk some holy moly next week. Oh yeah, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> it will it's be a great show. Great show. And Steve, how about you? How people follow you on social media? Uh, on Twitter is at Steve underscore Colto. K U L T Z O W. And Joe, how about you? Uh, underscore, it's actually J underscore Choppy, C I L F F I. And my Instagram handle is my full name, Joseph Joe Choppy. At any time, come on and talk hockey, baby. All right. That sounds good. Thanks again, guys, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. you got it. All right. Up next, I'm going to do a little pop culture. Talk some TV with Alan Austin right after this.